Hi, I'm Cheryl Gordon, and I'm thrilled to be with you today. When I was considering what to talk about, I thought about how so many of us these days find ourselves disagreeing with people we know and care about. Little things, big things, even huge things. They hold different beliefs than we do, and maybe we're not handling it well. We don't know what to do, nor how to do it. We do know it's upsetting. I thought it would be smart to consider how to handle this. So I turned to where I always turn, to Jewish sources. And well, today we're going to talk about the Jewish way to argue. We've all learned that it's bad to argue. And you might be surprised that I'm kind of encouraging it. The last thing that you would expect from me would be that. But actually, arguing in Judaism is both encouraged and a talent that we need to learn how to master. Of course, we need to equip ourselves to do this properly. No, not that kind of equipment. We need a game plan. You may very well have studied this before, but Judaism always suggests that we look to review and revisit things. And maybe, just maybe, this will help us better manage our exchanges with family and friends and others who hold different views of the world. And maybe, just maybe, this will help us keep our blood pressure low. When Rabbi Larry Kushner was a rabbinical student, he used to go to a delicatessen to, do, to study. And an older man, seeing the open tractate of Talmud on the table in front of him, said to him, let's have an argument. And the future Rabbi Kushner at that point said, there's nothing to argue with about. I believe in God. And then the gentleman said, I don't. Let's have an argument. In that moment, the point was lost on Rabbi Kushner. But soon after he got it, he came to recognize that in serious Judaism, we don't close the book on a good, important argument. We keep them going, and they are valued and even encouraged. Our religious tradition promotes disagreement while, making, while maintaining unity. In yeshiva study halls, students learn in pairs, and it's very noisy. It's nothing like the public library. And our tradition provides a game plan on how to argue properly. There's a whole body of knowledge centered around two terms. The first, machloket, machloket, is often translated as argument or disagreement. But it's actually more than a disagreement. It's a constructive disagreement. It's a sacred disagreement. Sacred disagreements keep the discussion alive, keep the door open, and are adaptable to new realities. The kind of machloket we need is a machloket b'shem shamayim. Rabbi Amy Alberg defines that as an argument fought for the sake of heaven. It generates truth and goodness and is greater than any small-minded, selfish desire. The purpose of any machloket, then, should be for the greater good, to improve the world. So what comes into play for a machloket b'shem shemaim? Well, the number one thing is civility. The Midrash teaches that derech eretz, the commandment to act with common decency, preceded the giving of the Torah. Courtesy elevates us and validates the other person. And as Lubavitch Rebbe and many others have said, it's really important to express disagreement without being disagreeable. So why does our tradition believe that this concept is sa of sacred disagreement is so key and is truly a good thing? Well, think about it. Disagreements actually breed creative resolutions. We would never want ideas to stagnate and freeze. We need to learn from each other. We need to cross-pollinate ideas. I admit that sometimes disagreements can make us dig our heels in 
and make it really almost impossible to consider things in a new light. So the goal always has to be that we keep evolving and that we keep the relationship going. I suspect that you're familiar with the great rivalry between the descendants of Hillel and the descendants of Shammai, disciples of the two of the greatest rabbis of the first century. And at one point, the Talmud states that these groups were contesting over 300 different issues. And yet, the two rival camps always treated each other with respect, with kindness and affection, and they never stopped mirroring within their families. That was because the arguments were limited to the matters at hand and never became personal. Then the Talmud goes on to say that while both sides were right, the law is in, in agreement with the house of Hillel. Because their scholars were kind and modest, they studied their own rulings and those of Beit Shammai, and were even so humble as to mention the opinions of Beit Shammai in their decisions. They deserved to lead because of their conduct. So what were those things? They demonstrated respect for the opinions of their adversaries. They didn't demonize the other side. They tried to represent faithfully the other people's opinions. And to do this, they had to listen well, well and to pay attention. That is the mark of true leadership, secure in their own convictions, yet humble enough to make room for someone else's. This is civility at its best. Clearly, the rabbis wanted Hillel's gentle and inclusive approach to win most of the time, but not to win in a way that ends the discussion. The answer is in the relationship created by the two sides as a result of hanging in there. This happens when the dominant side incorporates the needs and worries of the weaker side in its own argument and makes an honest attempt at finding some common ground. One argument between Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai lasted three years. Finally, a bat kol, a heavenly voice, declared, Elu ve'elu, divrei Elohim chayim. These and these are both the words of a living God. So how could both opposing sides be right? Because both contain some truth. The heavenly voice was teaching that no human being has a monopoly on truth. When we're embroiled in a dispute, we tend to assume that in order for me to be right, you must be wrong. But that's really not always the case. Rabbi Brad Hirschfeld has a book that's titled, You Don't Have to Be Wrong for Me to Be Right. And you don't have to read the book, I'll tell you. The message is, in every interpretation, there is some element of truth. You just gotta find it and build on it. So what's the recipe for arguing Bashem Shammai? Here are some tips from the Hillel Shammai Cheryl Handbook. You have to be courteous and polite you have to show respect, and you have to watch what comes out of your mouth. Just like feathers coming out of a pillow, you can never put them back in again. Try not to interrupt and try to listen. If you have something that's very important to say, take a deep breath, that one second matters. Pause and think. Actively look for common ground and validate that you're listen listening attentively by showing your attention and eye contact. And above all, keep in mind that greater purpose, Bashem Shemaim. What a constructive argument is not is a chance to prove that the other person is wrong. And it's really not about winning. It is about getting to a good result. In other words, Bashem Shemaim. This applies, in my opinion, everywhere. Small things, great things, everything negotiating chores around the house or what Netflix to watch, but it also applies to heavy lifestyle change decisions, religion, even politics. I'm not saying it easy, it's easy, but it does work. 
I remind you of another super important concept at this moment, and that is the concept of Shalom Bait. To be clear, we don't have to always have a disagreement. Every time there's a difference of opinion doesn't automatically trigger a disagreement, even a sacred one. There are times to let it go and times to deal with shalom bait. In other words, sometimes there's a case for silence and you need to pick your battles because peace at times is much more important than winning. However, on the other side, there are absolutely times when the right thing to do is to face that issue. Some things are and should be intolerable. And it would be absolutely wrong to be too polite. I once observed some years ago when I was a chaperone for a USY Shabbaton, an event after Shabbat, Motsi Shabbat, when several hundred kids were sitting in an auditorium and they were told that they were going to be entertained by a well-known popular comedian. And when the comedian started, he got pretty much right into things that were extremely uncomfortable for these kids. He made comments about Jewing people down. He made comments about Jews in ovens. It was outright bullying, and it was clearly hate speech. So what did these couple hundred teenagers do? They may have squirmed a little, but they stayed silent. Pretty much they did absolutely nothing. No one got up and said anything. Of course, this was an intentionally orchestrated event that had a definite educational point. This was a machloka opportunity waiting to happen. I do think that the kids were learned and will never forget that particular incident. But the lesson that they needed to learn and that we need to learn is by not saying anything at times like this, by retreating, the evil goes on. There will always be differing opinions. It's not right, however, to only talk to people with whom you agree. We, sp we spoke earlier about cross-pollinating ideas. Sometimes we just plain have to agree to disagree in a respectful way. And there may be a time when you actually have to create or attempt to create a machloket opportunity. Even if we don't feel that we convince anybody, Perhaps we le at least give them the opportunity to think about the issue, to open up a little crack in the door, and maybe even warm up our relationship. Sometimes we have need to try to make it happen. And on the other hand, for good reasons, there are times when we absolutely need to walk away. You need to think sometimes that maybe it would be best to skip a super difficult conversation asking yourself, is this the right person, the right time, the right place? What can I realistically hope to achieve by having this conversation? Once in a while, and it's happened to all of us, someone crosses the line and there's no opportunity for a machlokit. If someone crosses a horrible line and is disrespectful or uses hate speech, you need to respectfully leave, get out of there, request the end of communication. I'm going to ask you to introspect a little bit, a few questions, give you a few seconds to think about them. Can you think of a time when you retreated that maybe you shouldn't have? When you're having a constructive disagreement, do you ever make it a point to restate the other person's opinion? How good are you at really listening? Two people were fighting over a financial matter and couldn't reach an agreement. So what did they do? They took their case to the rabbi. He heard the first person's case, nodded his head and said, you're right. And the second litigant then stated his case and the rabbi nodded his head and said, you're also right. The gabai, who was standing nearby and listening, was justifiably confused. But Rebbe, he asked, how can they both be right? 
And the rabbi thought for a second and he responded, you're right too. This may seem like a joke, because it is, but it's also steeped in truth. I believe that we should use the Hillel Shammai model to have constructive disagreements that stay polite and civil, but that go beyond politeness and civility towards a true sharing and true listening. We need to be willing to voice our opinion and to listen to those of others with an open mind, even when it's uncomfortable. Very often we fall into the trap of us versus them and try to make sure that we win. Our sages teach us that there's a much better way. As we know from Pirkei Avot, who is wise, he who learns from everyone, even those we disagree with. The winning side is the one that keeps people working together for a common greater benefit, Bashem Shemaim. Thank you.